I really want to love Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. I love Rocksteady's Batman Arkham series. I love open world superhero action. I've even had short but passionate affairs with looter shooters. But something about this particular intersection of all those things just doesn't sit right. Whether it be the underwhelming loot systems, bland and repetitive mission design, or hollow post-game, I just can't see myself wanting to play much more now that I've burned past the campaign story. That's a big problem for a live service game aiming to keep our attention for months, if not years on end. It's also a shame as there's a good story being told in well-made cutscenes with snappy writing and performances carrying a lot of the weight. But beyond that, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League never consistently offers enough fun to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the successful games in this genre. While the comparison might seem like low-hanging fruit, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League really is of a similar construction to Marvel's Avengers, a game I spent dozens of hours enjoying despite its glaring deficiencies. They're both live service games aiming to offer extensive post-games. Of course, in Avengers' case, that promised service was cut short when Crystal Dynamics shut down development two years after launch. For Rocksteady, another famous single-player turned online developer, the first step toward trying to avoid a similar fate would be creating a compelling combat system system that makes me want to return to Suicide Squad week after week, but that's something it hasn't quite achieved at this point. The studio known for revolutionising tight melee combat with its Arkham games has instead opted to make this a third-person shooter, which is a bold choice, but one that doesn't make complete sense considering the traditional methods of violence implemented by most of Task Force X, aka the Suicide Squad. As far as the story itself goes, it doesn't take a brainiac to work out what's causing the Justice League to act out of sorts as they wreak citywide destruction with glowing-eyed glee. Brainiac's the one finally bringing order to this world. Make it a home for his people. All this, soon it'll be a new planet Kolu. Yes, traditional Superman villain Brainiac has hatched an evil plan to take over the planet and remake it in an image of his own creation. And that involves controlling members of the Justice League's minds. So, and you'll never guess this, the Suicide Squad is called in to kill the Justice League by any means necessary. What threatens to be a straightforward story fans have largely heard before branches out around the halfway point into interesting directions. That's in no small part thanks to the phenomenal character design work and script writing that brings each member of the cast to life as they successfully banter along that tightrope thin line between charming and insufferable. Just picture it, Harley Quinn kills the Justice League. Oh, Sidekick's got something to prove now that the boyfriend's dead. Sidekick? Oh, honey. <laughs> the late great Kevin Conroy excels in one of his final turns as the Dark Knight, showing us an even darker side to the Cape Crusader than we've seen from him before. Let their corpses strike fear into those who'd resist. Tara Strong is once again pitch perfect as the anarchic Harley Quinn, and Joe Sinoa, aka Samoa Joe, dryly delivers each of King Shark's one-liners to great effect. Playable team members Harley Quinn, Deadshot, King Shark, and Captain Boomerang are exciting characters with trademark weapons. From boomerangs to booming hammers and sharp shooting sniper rifles to sharp tooth snapping. What's especially disorienting is that while there are fun and wildly different abilities the Rocksteady could have taken advantage of to create varied vigilantes who each bring their own style of play to the table, instead they're all reduced to the same baffling blueprint, who seem to love nothing more than firing guns and occasionally throwing grenades. Granted, they do each have signature melee and traversal attacks, like Harley's sweeping baseball bat hits, or Boomerang's enemy chaining namesake, but the overwhelming focus here is on shooting and collecting an increasingly powerful arsenal of guns. Where the Arkham games had a much more deliberate flow as you waited for enemies to make the first move before delivering crushing counters, Suicide Squad cranks up the speed as you zoom around hurling bullets into bad guys at a relentless pace. It's undeniably impressive at times, with an emphasis still placed on combo chasing and stylish takedowns while taking no damage. There are even bits that remind me of some of my favourite action games, such as the shield harvest mechanic which encourages aggressive play, echoing the attitude of doom or control, wherein the best form of 
of defense is to attack even more. As is typical for a class-based game, each character specializes in certain skills and can be tweaked to your liking thanks to extensive skill trees. For me though, the biggest deciding factor in choosing which criminal fit my style best was in testing out each of their movement abilities, as most of them felt clunky at first. After a bit of experimentation, I settled on Aussie inmate Captain Boomerang and his teleporting Speed Force Gauntlet, which I used to flank enemy hordes to my heart's content. I steadily constructed an effective close-up boomerang build with traversal mods that gave me a 40% damage boost to enemies within 5 meters, and paired that with a freezing melee attack and a legendary shotgun that shattered all who got near. It was a satisfying playstyle, but I pretty much found all of the gear I needed to make each encounter a breeze on the normal difficulty by the story's halfway point. This meant I felt no need to engage in any of the crafting or looting systems for the most part, and instead just focused on tuning the talent tree as I unlocked more points to fill up my close and personal approach. Of course, with this being a looter shooter, the guns come in multiple tiers of rarity, ranging from standard, common and rare guns to unique, high-powered, notorious and infamous level weapons, which are all themed around DC villains. Outside of that bit of costuming though, the guns themselves are frustratingly bland. The world and characters are packed full of charm and colour, something that just isn't reflected in the dull arsenal. You'll largely be wielding a standard selection of rifles, SMGs, pistols, etc. as you circle around enemies with a routine flank and fire strategy. When you go to modify some life into your firearms, you're limited to fairly standard buffs, like critical damage boosts or cooldown decreases, none of which really lead into capturing any of that superhero slash villain magic. Instead of more damage boosts or predictable poison debuffs, I kept hoping to see something crazy, like a gun that fires exploding, chattering joker teeth, or a clay face cannon that covers the ground and enemies in clay, immobilizing them in the process. But having finished the campaign and done a fair amount of post-game grinding, there's just a disappointing lack of imagination on display here, even for those rarest top-tier options. That's particularly a shame because I can see the bones of a truly exciting loot and combat system here. It's just hidden in the blandness of its solid but unspectacular gunplay and weapons. It's not the combat itself that's necessarily the issue either, but more the rinse and repeat encounters you're given to use it in. I ain't dying next to a steel pimple with legs. Eyes up, people! Metropolis has come down with a seriously gnarly case of brainiac-induced acne as you go around popping seemingly endless amounts of purple spots and monsters who don't have the sharpest AI in the world. One consistent factor, however, is that the vast majority of these enemies are found on top of buildings protecting brainiac weaponry or causing a general nuisance, which meant most of my time felt like it was just bouncing from rooftop to rooftop whacking moles. In fact, a steady cadence of cutscene, rooftop battle, repeat persists throughout pretty much the whole of the campaign's roughly 10 hour runtime. It's just a stream of uninspired encounter designs with seemingly no ambition shown toward making any authored missions that stand out. Rocksteady built out its Gotham City with numerous landmarks that served as fantastic contained levels inside an open world. In Suicide Squad, however, interesting interiors are kept at a premium, with almost all of the action taking place high above the city and at great speed. Arkham City's combat arenas were so expertly designed, like mini action levels levels found within a sprawling open world with environmental takedown opportunities and creative ways to move around constantly present. But here, only blink and you'll miss it flashes of this philosophy can be seen. Come on then, you prick! This is a theme that sadly follows most of the headline encounters, with imagination going into only a couple of the boss battles. Most take place in circular arenas as you find tight windows to attack in. A prime example of this being the flash fight as you have to quickly time counter shots before dealing damage. The standout among them though has to be a brawl against Green Lantern and his arsenal of glowing constructs in a battle that delivers greatly on both spectacle and excitement by smartly implementing a large custom arena full of high vantage points that can 
also be used as cover. All of the heroes are a welcome challenge that crucially never feel too unfair, with each generously signposting attacks to avoid frustration, even if ultimately you are asked to just gun them down in similar fashions. There are impactful moments though, which are often full of wonder but go by in a flash. Clocking in at about 10 or 11 hours, Suicide Squad's main campaign isn't an especially short one, but is perhaps an underwhelming runtime when you consider we've waited almost 9 years for a new Rocksteady story, especially as its ending only really serves to set up future seasonal drops. That said, there are enough surprises and turns within it for it to stay consistently engaging, even if what you'll be doing on either side of the rewarding cutscenes isn't up to the same standard. Metropolis itself is a sun-soaked city where superheroes are treated like gods and monuments to them bookend its streets. It's regularly gorgeous, and if it wasn't for the small issue of a gigantic brain hovering above it causing widespread mayhem, would probably be a lovely place to spend a weekend. The art direction is superb, with a rich mix of architectural influences combining to create a uniquely inviting skyline. Yet, it all just feels oddly lifeless at the same time, like a beautifully constructed diorama collecting dust. Like the Arkham games, there's an eerie lack of civilian activity to make it feel like a place where people actually live that needs protecting. Time for a little interdimensional rendezvous. After the story is finished, you'll enter the post-game, where the live service nature of Kill the Justice League shows its hand fully, despite the studio going to great lengths to call it anything but a games as a service. Immediately, my worst fears were realised, as I was handed copies of missions I had played previously in the campaign with the same tired assortment of tasks. In truth, it calls Marvel's Avengers flashbacks to flicker into my mind as I told myself I just can't do this with my life again. I just can't. But truthfully, even Crystal Dynamics' unsatisfactory efforts offered better variety and more endgame goals to aim for. The headline activities upon entering the post-credits world are called incursions. These are short rinse and repeat missions that take place in the Elseworld featured in the story of the main campaign. A stop me if you've heard this one before, superhero multiverse. Unsurprisingly, these are all the same defend the objective and kill as many enemies in a time limit scenarios that I had already grown tired of. The lack of imagination is staggering, and the respect for your time is kept at a minimum. The only real incentive is to beat other players' times and send them an admittedly enjoyable taunt, or to grind and grind the same handful of encounters at higher difficulties over and over again to unlock guns with bigger damage numbers, which I guess I'll use to do something more useful when it arrives in a future update. I'll be technical, but I'll wing it. And once you max a character out at level 30 and have filled out their unique talent tree, all future XP points are placed into squad skills. Note, these aren't fun new abilities that inspire some much needed cooperative play, they are more mind-numbingly dull stat bonuses such as 0.1% damage reduction or a 0.5% assault rifle damage boost. It's a bland, uninteresting and repetitive post-game, and the antithesis of what has made Rocksteady's games so engaging in the past. Thankfully, there is one saving grace outside of the main story that Rocksteady has borrowed from their Arkham series. Now, riddle me this, what award is given for the fun challenges that punctuate otherwise tedious open world activities? I ain't chasing a bunch of riddles and bullshit. That's right, Riddler trophies have made their way to Metropolis. These puzzles and challenges dotted around the map offer sweet relief from the mundane missions, and although never overly challenging, do at least encourage you to look a little closer at the city you often spend so much time zooming past at speed. My shadow falls across the city, my piercing gaze knows no pity. Building out your character and sifting through the many menu screens to gain incremental stat boosts can be a chore, but nothing like keeping track of the five, yes five, different crafting currencies that Suicide Squad uses to make you feel like you're working part-time at the Metropolis Bureau de Change. They're all used to craft different mods, weapons and augmentations, and are completely separate from a premium currency that unlocks cosmetics such as outfits. Real retro. I was thinking something more. Forward. The store itself is relatively barren at the moment, with just one or two new looks available for each character. At £7.99 or $9.99 a pop, they aren't especially cheap either, but this is made exponentially worse when you realise this only unlocks the basic look for each outfit, with up to $40 needing to be spent to unlock every variety and colourway within each skin. Cosmetics might be costly then, but to Suicide Squad's credit, all seasonal gameplay content is set to be completely free of charge. Of course, 
I can only review what's in front of me. But Rocksteady has given us a look at the roadmap ahead, with new playable characters and environments promised thanks to those multiversal Elseworlds. It's unclear how much the upcoming episodic missions will truly move the story along, but plenty of remixed activities, enemy variants and cosmetic drops are a certainty. While I do find the combat to be enjoyable, I'm not sure it ever offers the variety or dynamic edge needed to carry Suicide Squad on its back without the promise of more story propping it up. The unsatisfying cliffhanger ending of the campaign does firmly hint at what we'll be doing in each of the seasons, and I truly hope it does move the story along considerably each time but I have my doubts. I think it's far more likely that I'll wait months down the line to see just how much has been added before revisiting the story, rather than checking in monthly to be fed the next scrap. It all prompts the biggest questions surrounding Kill the Justice League. Why is this a live service game with seasonal content drops? So far, I'm not convinced it's because Rocksteady desperately has more story it wants to tell in its DC universe, but more likely because Warner Brothers thinks it will make more money by steadily drip feeding cosmetics to its store. It's not a beneficial model for players who feel shortchanged at launch by a not quite finished story, and I assume can only be frustrating for a studio with such a strong history of creating single player stories to operate in this way. In the end, just like a world with no heroes left to defend it, we all end up losing. A muscle head, a nut job, something that offends my eyes, and a homeless person. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is a thoroughly frustrating game to play. There are things to enjoy here, with combat that's snappy enough to carry it through a genuinely good DC Comics story, artfully dressed in high production values, but everything else just falls down around it. Engaging mission design is nearly non-existent, the looter-shooter mechanics are tired and dull, and the grotesquely repetitive post-game leaves little to nothing to do of interest. The result is a bit of a mess that doesn't ever impress with any of its numerous ill-conceived ideas. Ideas. It's not bad, it's just disappointing from Rocksteady, pioneers of single player story action chasing already outdated multiplayer trends. A city of tomorrow built on the unstable foundations of yesterday. For more Suicide Squad, check out the opening minutes of the game, and for everything else, kill the Justice League, stick with IGN. Good to get out of that.